Hi everyone, uh, my name is Crispin Hiley. I'm a clinical academic and a clinical oncologist at, at UCLH and I'm the uh, host for the uh, uh, session today. So this is the first of our um, Cancer Research UK Radnet City of London uh, seminar series. Uh, and so just a little bit of housekeeping. So um, the idea of this monthly seminar series is to uh, initiate connectivity um, throughout the community and to, in it, into, into, and to give us insights into new radiation research developments in both clinical and non-clinical areas uh, and offers the opportunity for us all to develop our expert expertise and to collaborate more. So obviously if you could just keep your uh, videos and, uh, and cameras off, um, please raise your hand at the end if you'd like to raise, ask some questions or put a question into the, into the chat room. But I'm, uh, I'm really excited to, um, that um, Dr. David Fuller, who's an associate professor and medical director of the cancer imaging uh, um, department at the MD Anderson Cancer Center has uh, currently agreed to, to kick us off on our first sem seminar series. And he's gonna talk about uh, imaging applications for head and neck radiotherapy, toxicity monitoring and reduction. And David really uh, published some of the, the really great work uh, of, at looking at sort of adaptive radiotherapy planning and bringing in different imaging, imaging modalities to improve uh, treatments for, for patients with head and neck cancer. So Dave, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing. If you could take it away, that'd be great. Thanks so much everyone for coming. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see uh, the screen and some moving images just to calibrate uh, the, the AV. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to, to speak with you guys today. Um, we'll be sending out a permalink um, to the DOI of the talk. So I really want you to just kind of relax and just kind of soak it in um, rather than trying to take notes because this will be digitally available tomorrow um, for you to download and, and, and read at will. Um, I'm going to start with, I always start with my acknowledgements. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be funded by domestic, philanthropic, and um, industry funders who've done a lot of the work. Um, but I'm also the recipient of a huge amount of resources from our head and neck group at MD Anderson. There are now 11 of us who treat head and neck cancer only at MDACC. Um, we treat about 1,200 to 1,500 head and neck cancers a year in our group and, and I'm really quite thrilled uh, because uh, they, they really have, have powered uh, this effort. But we also work within a multidisciplinary head and neck group of surgeons, medical oncologists and neuroradiologists, all of whom are focused on these concepts of toxicity reduction and simultaneous improvements in cure. Within that, with my colleagues, Stephen Lyon, Kate Hutchison, a lot of whose work you'll see today, we have a formal multidisciplinary working group focused directly on symptom reduction in head and neck cancers. And we've been fortunate enough to have several projects funded looking at imaging in those applications. Simultaneously, I work with a group that applies uh, deep learning and machine learning approaches to complex biomedical data. And we've recently been funded in operations research um, with Rice University and Andrew Schaefer. And those efforts allow my wonderful lab um, and our wonderful trainees who, who really are the, the, the genius of our group. Um, many of whom uh, you guys probably know um, from, from international collaborations as well as our alumni. I think it's also important for us to realize that our goal is to get our patients back to their families, living activities that we all wanna do, being able to do the things they enjoy. And so life is more than just survival. And so we have to think about that when we think about patient um, toxicity reduction. So the premise I'm coming from is this idea that the future should be image guided. And as you saw from that transition just now from CT to MRI, we think that there's fundamental advantages if you can image not only anatomy, but functional and spatial alteration in tumor and normal tissue. And, and I see Marcel is on here. These are things I, 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 I scraped from him when I was at NKI as a, as a graduate student. But we really want the idea of adaptive therapy to be something that's, that's powered by anticipatory inputs, things that happen early enough that you can change your cancer care. You want them to be actionable. They have to be something you can modify. Data that tells you something has happened is less important than something that you can correct. You need it to be accurate in space and time. And this has always been a knock on MRI imaging that we'll talk about in a moment. But it's important that we also want that, that input, in this case imaging, to be additive. We want more than one feature at a time. And while CT is pretty good at, at, at uh, electron density um, uh, derivation, there's other things that we can move on to besides just getting dose calculation or positional alignment 
as we move the ball forward. Now, as a head and neck cancer doctor, I'm bringing that paradigm into a clinic in the United States where there's around 50,000 new cases of head and neck cancer a year. And the vast majority of these in the, in the coming years are going to be human papilloma virus associated cancers. In the United States, we've seen an explosion of these tumors. They are rampant and until the vaccine generation ages out, um, we probably will see that this continues to rise. So, so uh, viral cancers of the head and neck are now the predominant form. We treat about 500 of these a year at Anderson in our clinic alone. Now, what's also shifted though, is these are highly curable tumors compared to the classic tobacco associated cancers. And KNN showed um, uh, now uh, more than 10 years ago that these HPV positive patients were in fact unlikely to die of their disease. They are incredibly radio curable compared to the historic head and neck cancer population. And not only that, their disease was far less likely to return after therapy. So cure became something that was a predominant um, endpoint for patients. And, and we still see that today. If you look at the outcomes of the recent, um, uh, in, or the recent uh, multi-site um, NRG oncology group for head and neck cancer, cisplatinum and radiation therapy gave you a two-year survival that was greater um, in almost 90% and five-year survival that was uh, 85% or, or higher. These are staggeringly high numbers compared to um, what we used to expect, which was 50% survival at five years when I was in training. Um, even more important is the number of local regional failures are incredibly small. So less than 10% of patients will have the tumor come back after we treat them. However, increasingly because of that, survival is not living alone. There's more to life than survival. And function of the patient matters a lot. In, in the head and neck, there's an, a lot of real estate that's incredibly valuable. So our treatments have been injuring, but leaving intact, non-surgical treatments at least, these areas of the head and neck, and they were just kind of considered collateral damage. The oral mucosa, the base of tongue, pharyngeal constrictors, the esophagus, and the larynx. We'll talk about why these, these things have been so important, but historically we knew they were there but, but in our quest to cure the patient, damaging them was acceptable. In fact, in the conventional radiotherapy era, um, we were treating the tumor and the adjacent normal tissue, in this case, the exquisitely radiosensitive parotid glands here, shown here in cross-sectional CT in blue, um, with these historic fields and we just blasted through them. So the tumor was covered, but we um, obliterated a salivary function. And so when we talked about in, in the era, uh, my early training, conventional radiotherapy was for head and neck cancer patients was dry mouth, dry mouth, dry mouth, dry mouth, and then a laundry list of some other side effects that we weren't as concerned about because the xerostomia and dry mouth was so severe. In the 2000s, the capacity to um, implement intensity modulated therapy initially in the United States was driven by head and neck parotid spirit. So we could, we could uh, cover the tumor and yet move the dose away from these comparatively radiosensitive parotid glands. And uh, work that you guys are, are of course familiar with um, uh, from Chris Nutting really defined this uh, for our field in the landmark Parsport trial where patients were randomized to conventional radiotherapy or intensity modulated radiotherapy. And we saw striking differences in xerostomia where the conventional group had virtually every patient had life altering cripplingly severe dry mouth. Now uh, with, with, with IMRT, uh, a, a, almost a quarter of patients might have severe xerostomia um, at, uh, at two years out. So, so game changer. So at some level, xerostomia became less of a concern and we began to turn our attention to this huge host of additional side effects that we'd been causing the entire time but we're just less brutal to the patient than dry mouth. And this, this um, was amplified by the fact that intensity modulated radiotherapy meant that now patient specific dose meant that not everybody got the same radiation plan. In the old days, radiation plans were pretty similar. Um, a structure was either inside the field or outside the field, it was pretty binary. Now, different patients got a different conformal plan based on the anatomy and location of the tumor, uh, 
that might be radically different for the same um, type of tumor or the same uh, type of indication. So no two base of tongue tumors are now alike in terms of their radiation plan. We also became aware during the same uh, post IMRT interval that the rate of aspiration events was skyrocketing such to the degree that head and neck cancer patients, um, because they were living longer, instead of dying from their cancer at two years, were now living years later and then dying of aspiration pneumonias. And so if you look at head and neck cancer patients, um, this is from population databases from Lauren Mel's group, you see that these head and neck cancer patients have um, a, a substantial nearly tripling incidence of rate of aspiration uh, pneumonia events. And even these oropharynx patients uh, still, you know, as many as a quarter of them uh, within 10 years of radiotherapy will have a, a detected aspiration event. This was also coupled with the fact that we saw this, this long-term skeletal muscle depletion that really has um, effects in terms of survival. So patients who come in with skeletal muscle depletion before radiotherapy who are frail, they, okay, we knew that they didn't do very good. But patients who came in with normal skeletal muscle uh, and then got depleted had survival that looked as bad as patients who um, had HPV, positive, HPV negative cancers. That skeletal muscle depletion as a risk factor um, is as, at least in our series, appears to be as big a, a driver as, as uh, aspects of the tumor status. Um, even worse, if patients received a feeding tube and had skeletal muscle depletion, if they had severe nutritional compromise, their outcomes in terms of survival were compromised to an incredible degree with 40% um, survival at, at um, uh, uh, greater than five years. Again, this tells us that that subset of patients who do have toxicity related to therapy can actually have their, uh, their, their, their survival outcomes compromised, not just their quality of life. And this is not something that, that predates the IMRT era. Um, aspiration events in our series, we think we're a pretty good institution. Again, aspiration rates in our hands are, are about 20%. So this led to a series of studies where we started um, to evaluate the dose to these normal structures of the head and neck. So not just sparing the parotids, but as you saw in recent presentations that will become stereo care again by the Chris Nutting and his team looking at these dysphagia associated um, structures or DARS, uh, that, that there's multiple areas of the head and neck that are involved in swallowing and they're, and they're all over the place. And the sad part is dose to any one of those structures can be potentially damaging. So this is a good example where um, we can't really just say anymore, avoid the parotids and now tr we treat the tumor. And with those two goals, now we have optimized radiotherapy forevermore and everything's great. We really have to think holistically about not just parotids, but also swallowing muscle, as we'll show in a moment, bone, and all of these other areas. Simultaneous to that in MD Anderson was um, beginning in 2011, 10 years ago, we started on a project to um, participate in an MR Linac consortium with the knowledge that we, we, we would be moving towards an integrated uh, MRI treatment device. And there's a couple of manufacturers that make these now. And so one of the things that that has helped us do is create this hybrid program. Um, and the device is really uh, neat. Okay, it's fun to have a new toy. But the premise that we looked at was, okay, we treat soft tissue and we treat tumor and we use CT all day long, but CT is really not great for seeing soft tissue anatomy nor tumor without contrast. So we started to look for applications that we could use this new, new paradigm, this new MR orientation and say, how could we use this to evaluate things that we were doing already? So we started off with some very simple projects. One was, was just looking at, okay, could we, could we use this to um, maybe improve some swallowing sparing? And we ran some in silico studies that suggested that this would be possible. Over a period of years, we executed a, a number of kind of fundamental quality assurance projects. So um, we first just showed, okay, we can deliver radiation plans and they're not gonna be any worse than the plans we're delivering on CT. So we, so we just showed comparability um, when, we're, when we're looking at radiation dose estimation. And we worked to show that we could get geometric fidelity with the MRI images that was uh, approximate to that we would get on CT. 
So there was a lot of work done with kind of digital phantoms showing that we could, we could quantify this error. And so now we had a spatially accurate way of, of quantifying the deformation. And then, and then knowing with these physical phantoms, whether we could identify things spatially. So our next question was, well, could we use this to track where things were happening in time? So um, building on some great data from UMC Utrecht, uh, we, um, we partnered with them to look and see if we could look at these swallowing muscles and evaluate how much they were moving during, during treatment so that we could give a more accurate treatment through PTV reduction. Because when patients are swallowing, these structures really move a lot. And so you can see from this diagram, if I'm targeting this base of tongue area, I'm having to cover a lot of incidental normal tissue just to account for the motion that's occurring during the treatment. If I, can quanti if I can quantize that motion and make corrections for it through mobilization or through better um, tracking or gating, um, then maybe I could shrink those margins down effectively. So we began a study, a series of studies just to track the swallowing motion of each of these important muscle structures that we'd, we'd seen had dose response relationships and were involved in swallowing. And with Jinsong Yang, we, we uh, took what happened with these uh, 2D images over time. We constructed motion um, envelopes so that you could see that different muscles and different regions, the base of tongue moves less than the larynx, but has a different frequency profile. The soft palate moves different than the pharyngeal constrictors. And then we could, um, we could track that motion and the magnitude of it in these different areas and their relationship during a swallowing cycle. And by doing that, we came up with an approach where we could create these variable margins and safely reduce in some regions with um, uh, uh, a bite block so that the tongue doesn't move to um, uh, occasionally get to, to very high levels of spatial certainty, almost as close as we could get to non-moving structures for stereotactic. So we could get submillimeter margins for fraction ART with a lot of work but it requires an immobilization effort that goes above and beyond our standard of care. So, so right now we're using three millimeters um, at present. So now, now we had a potential way that we, we were able to spare some of these tissues, the edge dose from exuberant uh, PTV expansion. And, and now we could start thinking about how we could target and leverage the information we were getting from the MRI better. So again, it, we, we kept coming back to this idea that, well, could we, we're getting these MRIs in these patients for radiation planning. We're gonna be getting them for free on this MR Linac device. How do we get this input data and start doing something with it? So we, we started to think about maybe instead of just thinking about these structures as something that happens in space, what if we could derive some functional information from them? Um, could we leverage these, these data sets as quantitative data? So instead of just using it to say, okay, here I can see where these parotids are and now I'll stay away from them. Maybe what if I could learn something that's happening about these structures in the head and neck? And uh, one of the things we started with was um, surprisingly a, 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 a side effect called osteoradionecrosis. Osteo means bone, radio means radiation, necrosis means death. It's literally bone death from radiation in the jaw. And where we see this is when you look in the patient's mouth after radiation, um, several, you know, three months to years after, they develop this exposed bone, which is incredibly painful. And that exposed bone can lead to a um, reduction in the, in the um, cortical bone an eventual fracture. And so you have these patients that have survived radiotherapy to their head and neck with a very curable tumor only to then have their entire jaw removed in this incredibly morbid surgery. And um, we're, we, again, we're, we think we're a really good facility at MD Anderson. We have a rate of about six to 7% each year, which, you know, if you think about 1200-ish patients, that's 65 patients a year. And we're having to deal with that. This is not, again, something that used to happen in th the 3D CRT era. In the IMRT era, again, this is MD Anderson data, um, we showed that for IMRT, we're about 6.7% um, with median follow-up of 30 months. And if you count in population databases from the United States jaw injury, this number might be as high as 14%, right? So, so, so patients are really, this is a real thing that patients have in follow-up. 
part of this, if we go back to this idea of you know, patient specific but heterogeneous dose spread all over the head with IMRT um, is because the volume of mandible radiated has skyrocketed in recent years. The pre-IMRT era hit the mandible with high dose but covered a limited volume. What we see now is that you know, you're seeing regions of the mandible routinely are getting maximum voxel doses that are much higher than they historically did in the pre-IMRT era. So the mandible in some ways may actually be at more risk. Now, if you know a little bit about osteoradionecrosis, the predominant theory of why it happens is that you're devascularizing the bone with radiation. So the bone becomes devascularized um, through hypocellularity, you kill off those cells. It becomes hypovascular, the blood flow is impaired, and then it becomes hypoxic, and that's what leads to um, the, the um, growth of these um, lesions and then the, the expansion of the lesions into the cortical bone. So the primary treatments that most of the time are used are debridement for revascularization and hyperbaric oxygen, and then a drug called pentoxifline that helps blood flow return to these areas. Now, the problem is almost all of the things you're using to evaluate osteoradionecrosis don't show anything about blood flow. It's CT scans that look at the cortical bone, the, the bone matrix itself, but don't really tell you anything about the vascularity. And historically, people haven't liked to use MRI because the geometric accuracy of the measurements in tracking these lesions is pretty poor. So these are two different um, measurements on the same patient in immobilization using two MRI sequences. And this measurement comes out at 8.5 millimeters and this, or so 8.5 centimeters, the same measurement on the other sequence gives you 8.7 uh, uh, centimeters, right? So if you have a, a, a standard geometric inaccuracy of two millimeters uh, and you're trying to monitor very thin cortical changes, uh, radiologists don't like it. So we said, well, what if we were to use the CT to see the cortical bone, but then use these functional MRI techniques to look at changes in the vascularity of these structures in the head and neck. And we would start with osteoradionecrosis because the mandible doesn't deform much. And so it's an easy structure to work with. The mandible is in the same place comparatively um, on, on the scans. Um, why is this important clinically? Again, because we, we started with osteoradionecrosis because it's the hub uh, symptom of a syndrome of side effects that are really, really bad. So Kate Hutchison's group looked at 349 oropharynx patients who, uh, who were survivors. The patients who had osteoradionecrosis had significant amounts of dysphagia and had, um, if, if you had severe osteoradionecrosis, you had dysphagia um, as well. So that all of these other symptoms, dry mouth, pain, fatigue, seem to co-localize with this um, uh, osteonecrosis. The other reason we picked osteoradionecrosis is we had some preliminary data that suggested that it was something that was potentially modifiable by where we put this low intermediate dose. So um, some work from Abdullah Muhammad had showed that it's not just the point dose in one area, but it's really the volume of the mandible that may, uh, that may matter. And so if you spare subvolumes of the mandible, well, that, that's something that was actionable. So we started getting dynamic contrast enhanced imaging on these patients. And um, this helped us to see the tumor and to do quantitative metrics of the tumor, but it also showed um, this wash in of contrast and then the wash out, we could take that kinetic map and normalize it to an input function in the artery. And then we had a pharmacokinetic map of where the blood flow was in the head and neck. And so we could take that, um, that MRI scan, we could relate it to the dose grid, propagate the images using a registration technique and then track over time where there were changes in blood flow relative to where there was dose. What we found when we looked at this is that there were identifiable patterns related to radiation dose, but it wasn't like a simple relationship. So it wasn't radiation dose goes here and that's where um, there's, uh, there's injury, right? It was, it, was, it was more complex because there was a temporal response. 
some patients had an increase in these vascular ulcerations that then persisted after radiation therapy. Other patients had, were stable throughout, and some patients had a transient rise and then a revascularization and recovery. So um, with Brian Hobbs and our group, we were able to do this kind of fancy modeling and show, however, that we could um, effectively predict which areas were going to um, uh, have vascular injury uh, based on the, um, the imaging data alone. So we had a marker now for not, not just radionecrosis, but pre-radionecrotic um, uh, uh, vascular ulceration. We then confirmed that in a data set, again, by Abdullah Muhammad at our group, where he took patients who'd had radiation to both sides of the mandible. One side had gotten osteoradionecrosis, one side did not. So the patient was their own control, if you will. And we took the DCE measurements from one side and the other, and we compared them so that now we had a marker that was a um, uh, indicator of devascularization, alteration in the normal bone, and and ORN. So we've, um, this, is, this is really exciting work because now for bone at least, we've been able to show these vascularization effects, their relationship to dose, their recovery after radiation, which might be modifiable with drugs, are all things that we can now follow and track effectively with imaging data. And while we were at it, we did some work. Uh, this is by Sana Van Dyke, um, who's from UMC Groningen. Um, we're looking at MR sequences that give uh, 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 a spatial representation of the cortical bone that is as good as CT. So very shortly, we're going to be moving over. So instead of getting a CT and an MRI in every patient, now they can save the step. Now, this doesn't mean that the CT is worthless. Some other work within our group has been looking at what if we could use radiomics to detect these vascular changes potentially within the CT scans rather than having to get this complicated MRI. So um, Suptik Baria has a, a paper that's now um, in press uh, that, uh, that shows where we looked at the same kind of approach, the same patients who had the bilateral DCE. We took their CT scans and, and tried to determine whether we could get a radiomics marker. And it turns out that radiomics markers that have a delta over time seem to be more informative. Once we kind of figured out this technique though, we said, okay, well, let's take that same approach and let's apply it to swallowing muscles. So the same kinds of radiation vascularization changes we saw in the bone, which doesn't deform much. Um, once you accounted for deformation and changes over time, you could see those same things in um, irradiated muscle. So that whether it's the myelohyoid or the pharyngeal constrictors involved with swallowing in the front and back of the larynx respectively, that these changes over time could be tracked. We also wanted to try and find techniques that were not necessarily as niche as this fancy radiomics or fancy dynamic contrast enhanced imaging. So we were like, well, are there some techniques we could use that are just basic run of the mill stuff that you could get on a surveillance imaging that you would get to get on a patient anyway? So we started looking at um, just changes in T1 and T2 signal intensity on MRI. The, very, the most basic kinds of MRIs you get on every patient every time. And could we see these radiation changes in muscle um, if we were looking at those things uh, as a function of radiation injury? So uh, we started with nasopharynx patients who, at least at our facility, get an MRI on every follow-up visit. And we were able to show that the patients who had um, high radiation to these muscles had this change in signal alteration in T1 intensity um, that appear to be associated with fibrosis. So this T1 change late after radiation um, was identifiable. And if you, if you register the two images together, you could see in the subtraction image, the difference in the, um, uh, the delta in the T1 alteration in these pharyngeal constrictors back here. So when you do the subtraction, you see that it's, it's really quite apparent that, that the, the, the intensity of these muscles has, has altered in areas where they got high dose. And we could match that to the radiation dose so that the more radiation you got, the, the higher the signal intensity change. So we took that, that, that retrospective data set, which had used T1 weighted images acquired during regular surveillance. Um, and T1 weighted images are the ones you normally get for anatomy, but they're not quantitative images. So we could see these, these trends 
but the imaging we were using was really not built for quantitative assessment. So we ran a prospective study on our proton cohort where we collected the, the same surveillance imaging, but we substituted a T1 and T2 map MRI. So that instead of getting semi-quantitative T1 weighted and T2 weighted images, we actually had something that we could very reliably quantize in terms of um, the, the changes in the, in the image intensity. And what's important there is we picked sequences that we calibrated with the radiologist so that they could still use them for all of the surveillance stuff they would wanted to use anyway. And what we were able to see was that that effect held true. You could still see on treatment, you saw edema and inflammation in, in terms of treatment. But after treatment, this fibrotic effect was quite visible and could be related to the radiation dose um, quite, quite readily. Here is an example. This is that T2 alteration and edema, um, again, matched to the dose grid. But because these patients were on a prospective trial, we could also demonstrate that the changes in the imaging preceded changes in muscle-related swallowing dysfunction so that we could identify, based on thresholds, which patients would convert from a normal swallow to a um, damaged swallow using a technique called digest, which is a way to quantify the amount of swallowing dysfunction on a barium swallow. So by using this technique, we could see that the change in imaging was related to this injury. Now, all of this is really great and fun, but we haven't even started talking about the fact that we also then were gonna try and use this to image the tumor better too. So we've, we've been thinking about the patient because most of our patients are gonna live, but what if we could reduce the side effects by shrinking the volume we radiated of the tumor? For many years, MD Anderson has used an approach where we get a mid-therapy CT scan and we adapt the radiation plan based on weight loss. And um, David Schwartz, uh, pioneered this technique in a phase two trial he did several years ago. The problem is without contrast, you really can't see what's happening with this tumor or nodal volume that's in place. It's just hard to see on CT. So all we're really doing is verifying that the initial plan we gave hasn't degraded because the patients lost all of this mass, right? So this is adaptation just to, um, just to maintain the prior radiation dose. Even so, Dave Schwartz showed that level of adaptation, mid-therapy, no consideration of the, of the tumor at all, was enough to improve patient-reported outcomes and objective toxicity measures, right? Just that intervention, just making sure you delivered your, the same plan you thought you were delivering at the beginning. Well, now with this MRI device, we were soon to be poised to have the capacity that instead of not being able to see the tumor like you see here on the CT, I defy you to tell me where the edge of that tumor is. I wouldn't want you changing my radiation plans based on your guess of where the edge of that tumor is. But now without contrast on T2 imaging, you can quite nicely see the edges of the tumor volume. And even with the T1 non-contrast, you can get a, a much better idea of the, the disruption of anatomy than with the CT. So this is where we are in the present. Where we wanna move in the future is the idea of, of implementing spatially accurate functional imaging to augment this. So again, on that same proton study, we were getting pre and mid therapy MRIs at the same time we were getting CTs. And we um, instituted a sub-study where instead of getting mid therapy, we got um, two scans a week. And we said, what would happen if we just shrank the gross tumor volume uh, high dose region with these three millimeter margins as the tumor shrank. And when the tumor was gone, we dropped the high dose region. So we did an in silico study with Abdullah Muhammad where he showed that the average tumor, an average tumor is, a, is an approximation, not necessarily that each individual patient does not have the same benefit, but really not much happened the first week of treatment. And then there was a plummeting in the volume of the tumor and then not much happened the last week. So you really didn't have to adapt every week if you were being resource limited, you could, you could kind of pick your, pick your point of reference. But that would lead to what we anticipated would be a almost 10% uh, reduction in the raw rate, one third um, proportional reduction in the rate of dysphagia and a substantial reduction in the rate of feeding tubes. Now remember feeding tubes are associated with much worse survival. So we were like, well, maybe we're not gonna improve survival by 
killing more cancer, but maybe we'll improve survival by having less people get feeding tubes. So we constructed a phase two clinical trial um, with our, our colleague Ying Yuan, um, and we recently completed the 15 patient single arm phase one uh, safety roll-in for a study that will then um, now be expanding to randomized in February of 2021. Uh, the study basically takes that same approach. It gets um, daily scans on the MR Linac, but as the tumor shrinks each week, we basically replan and shrink the gross tumor volume high dose region. And when that gross tumor volume um, high dose region is gone, then all we cover with is microscopic elective dose. So it's a pretty simple concept. You just, you find the tumor each week, you radiate it with a three millimeter margin, and when it's gone, you drop that high dose region and just mop up microscopic disease until you're done with therapy. Um, we were really excited about this. Um, we've, we've completed 15 patients so far. Um, results are pending, um, but I can say, um, I have permission to say for our data safety monitoring board that our results in terms of um, disease control and our results in terms of feeding tube placement look really um, uh, impressive and, and, and that's good. The reason for that is more than 50% of our HPV positive patients will have complete shrinkage of either the primary or the lymph node volume by halfway through treatment. So you're treating microscopic disease by week three in either the primary or the lymph node um, in 50% in of our patients, right? Um, the patients who don't have a complete response by week three the vast majority, another third, have had a greater than 50% reduction. So if you can just reduce the volume you're radiating, your toxicity burden can be reduced um, substantially. So here's, a, here's an example case. Uh, this is one of our MR Linac patients. This is the pre-therapy volume on a pretty big uh, tumor node conglomerate in this patient's um, left neck and into the tonsil. So um, pretty large, pretty, pretty hungry tumor. Um, uh, and uh, one that normally we would just do a mid-therapy adaptation. When we look at week three, what we saw was that there was a, this is the pre-therapy volume and I've outlined the extent of what we would radiate in high dose pre-therapy, but this is what it had shrunk to. So all of this brachial plexus, all of these uh, additional swallowing structures, all of this laryngeal apparatus really getting blasted for something that's now no longer even remotely involved um, uh, either geometrically or physically. So Bridget McDonald has recently published our, our initial implementation on the MR Linac, and we're really pleased with her work because it's a first start in showing in a very conservative, not really wacky, don't shrink the GTV every week, but just kind of like making sure that we're delivering the plans we thought we were delivering at the beginning Kind of approach. We can do the same things we were doing with CT, only now we can see tumor and now we can see lymph nodes more effectively. The nice part about that is we're also simultaneously capturing all of that normal tissue data so that we can start to eventually build in, as you'll see in a moment, considerations for that. What's also cool is while we're getting that information, the MRI, and we do mid therapy, and the MR Linac allow us the capacity to get functional diffusion weighted imaging. So this is that functional DWI tracking the, the, um, the same volume that you see on the T2 weighted image each day for anatomic assessment. For those of you guys who are familiar with diffusion weighted imaging in a very simplistic kind of you know, um, overview way, it's a representation of the amount of movement of water in a cube in a voxel of tissue. So that the more unrestricted the water is, um, in terms of being the, in the extracellular, extravascular space or free water, the less dense the area is. If there's a lot of free water floating around, it's not inside cells or inside vessels. So when we change or radiate these tumors, this alteration in the fluid restriction, um, which is called the apparent diffusion coefficient, apparent, it's measured diffusion because it's the motion of the free water coefficient because it's coefficient. Um, this, this diffusion coefficient or water restriction can be tracked over time. In those same pilot studies we'd shown before, we were getting DWIs on patients. And so we were able to see that the change in diffusion preceded the change in volume. So you could tell which patients were gonna have really shrunken tumors in um, week three, four by what was happening week one, two 
on their diffusion. So this is anticipatory imaging, imaging that tells you what's gonna happen and then allows you to potentially modify earlier. And what was nice was we could track these things on um, the primary and the nodes that did not exactly respond the same way. So sometimes the node would respond very quickly and the primary wouldn't. Sometimes the primary would respond very quickly and the node wouldn't. But the trend in terms of, of DWI alteration, diffusion alteration preceding the, um, the volumetric shrinkage was impressive. So much so that if we normalized by any number of diffusion parameters, we could predict which patients had a complete response. Now again, complete response here is complete response mid therapy, which patients had no tumor after three weeks, right? So, so pretty impressive, pretty impressive work there. Um, and that idea, if you picked a couple of those different approaches, you could then integrate that so that you could pick these early rapid responders and have a trigger for adapting therapy. That has become the basis of what is our current work, which is figuring out how to get good DWI images so that we can use them on the MR Linac device and then re-optimize the plan based on this quantitative map. Um, so we're doing this work in silico because it's at the moment, we just can't get DWI scans that are spatially accurate enough to make those changes. But the next level is then to say, how can we make those changes? And this is Bridget McDonald again, who had that prior paper so that we can also account for that reduction in dose to the normal structures. If the, the goal should not just be think of the tumor, think of the tumor, think of the tumor, it's can we re-optimize based on that DWI and based on DWI information in a way that we can spare normal tissue as well. With that in mind, we've worked with Andrew Schaefer and the Rice Group to say, what if we used a mathematical technique called the Markov decision process to decide when to adapt? So instead of adapting every day, which is really time consuming, our goal is to have a process where we feed in the anatomic imaging data and we feed in the functional imaging data. And then we use a mathematical model that says, okay, you've got 33 treatments left. You can adapt today and have a big effect. Oh, on the other hand, now you've only got three treatments left. You're really not going to get much gain in normal tissue sparing if you adapt today. So that we're making the optimum decision for different organ structures. So maybe today's adaptation is driven by a potential dose reduction to the mandible, but tomorrow's adaptation may be um, by a dose reduction in the parotids. Maybe next week's adaptation is because we see that there's an ADC or a volume shrinkage that can spare the pharyngeal constrictors. Our hope is to really move to something where patients receive a personalized plan where when we start the radiation, we don't know what radiation dose they're gonna get or what geometry it's gonna have, but it changes so that we get the best plan, the best geometry and the best outcome we possibly can for that patient based on what's happening to the patient in real time rather than what happened to the last 600 patients we treated. So that's our, that's our goal and that's our challenge. Um, we, uh, imaging is, um, is something we're enthused about, but it's no panacea. And so we've been struggling with these problems of how to spare patients side effects and maintain these high rates of cure for years. And it's not gonna go away tomorrow, but we, we feel that this is a problem that, 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 um, that, that is worth addressing. And it's meaningful and fulfilling to think that we could have more patients surviving longer with better quality of life. So even though we don't think that, that it's gonna be an easy thing, we believe that the future is um, enhanced by uh, these machine aided technologies. And if, as we can see these problems better, we may see solutions better too. So with that, I thank you for your time. I'm happy to um, entertain any questions you guys have. Thanks, Dave. That's, um, that's a, a great talk. So um, I'll, I'll kick off. There's a couple of questions from Marcel in, in, in the chat, but perhaps while I just um, give you these, Dave, I, there's obviously quite a few people on the call and, and certainly some students. So, so it'd be great if some of the students wanted to to ask a question, this hopefully this isn't uh, this should be a non-intimidating forum where everyone can ask any questions they've got. So I think Marcel's first question really is is about going back to the first part about swallowing being a rare event and is that worthwhile to, to manage that? Yeah. So so swallowing swallowing is a um, swallowing is a potentially rare event, but the frequency of swallowing varies immensely between patients. And so when we did the survey, what we found is. Um, some patients swallow the entire time 
and they have incredible amounts of hesychastic motion here in this, in this subregion of the myelohyoid, which is both radiation sensitive and in other cases where the tumor is. So it's not that the motion, it's not swallowing motion is one thing that happens all over. Different regions have different, have different areas. The other thing we found, I'll tell you, is when you immobilize one part of the swallowing function, the other side compensates. So when you put a bite block in and immobilize their base of tongue, you gain swallowing motion in the larynx as they compensate with what's called a pharyngeal swallow. And so we swallow kind of have to pick and choose. Yeah, we kind of have to pick and choose what, what approach we're going to use for that. You know, when you go to the dentist, you're very aware of swallowing because if you yes. don't swallow, you yes. drown. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. We actually, we actually teach the patients a pharyngeal swallow so that they can clear secretions with a bite block in so that they can't use their tongue, um, which is a little trick. Um, and then the other question about microscopic disease, um, the density of the microscopic disease is higher where the tumor just went invisible in some areas. And there's the question about that reperfusion boundary. So we don't think you should go zero CTV on those, right? We still put a CTV on them. On the other hand, the fact that the area is, um, is now uh, microscopic does suggest that the density is lower than the, than the original index tumor. Well, so of course. We've, the, way we've, the, way we've kind of com the way we've kind of compromised is we picked a floor dose that um, was tried in the RTOG study. So we picked, a, we picked a floor that everyone agreed was a reasonable dose for microscopic disease um, in, in prior data, but 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 it's a it's a it's a it's a boundary state that we picked to, for our own for our own um, anxiety reduction. Um, now I, I can't see any other um, hands up or, or questions in the in the chat, but I mean I guess. Hi, sorry. Hi, all right, sorry. Um, is it okay if I just ask a quick question? Sorry, I'm Shola, one of the um, oncology yeah, cool. trainees here in London. I'm also an honorary postdoc clinical fellow in neuro-oncology at UCL. Thanks for the excellent um, presentation, Dr. Fuller. I've just got two questions. So um, I understand um, Dixon images or Dixon sequences are quite uh, in vogue now, especially on the MRLNAC machines, and they're quite good as well for fat-only and water-only imaging. I don't know whether you've had experience with using Dixons um, for your acquisitions and also for your modeling. Um, the second question is, um, you know, you mentioned T1 maps and also ADC. Um, is it possible to probably maybe develop models where you can incorporate, uh, incorporate T1 maps and ADC in AI driven models to improve your prediction for all this um, response monitoring or toxicity um, by any chance? Yeah, that's a, that's a phenomenal, phenomenal question. Um, so one thing I will tell you is right now we're, I think your two questions are kind of linked. Right now, when it comes to MR sequence modification or implementation, we're stuck with a portfolio supplied by the vendors and then the trade-offs that occur between spatial resolution, speed, and, and geometric um, uh, fidelity, right? So, so some of the Dixons work really well. We use it a lot. Siemens has a Dixon DWI that's really good, but it, it may not be transferable to our Philips MRL. Right or our three Tesla GE research. So, so there's a there's a there's an issue there because we have to calibrate each sequence for each application for each vendor against the gold standard. It's a lot of a lot of standardization work. That said, this idea of what's called MR fingerprinting that you raised is the idea of simultaneous acquisition, a slightly longer scan, but you could get T1, T2, ADC and potentially things like spin lock or T1 row imaging, which we think is a great fibrosis candidate, all at the same time. Um, the, the issue is to, to generate those AI based or AI assisted models requires a lot of input data. So we're in the process of just trying to collect reams and reams and reams of patients with in immobilization, ADC maps, T1 maps, T2 maps, T1 row maps, so that we can then power this. But I wouldn't be surprised if 10 years from now, you run one sequence and you get everything you want, right? I, I really think that the future of that is pretty close. It's just a matter of getting enough, enough um, data to power these AI processes. But great question. I, think, I really think it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, the, uh, the question I had was uh, um, just going back to how you're obviously dropping the dose in, in the 50% of patients who have a, a, a response. 
What about the other 50% who aren't responding? I mean, is there a way, do you think, to, to increase the dose or, or do something for those patients in, in an adaptive way? Yeah, we have. So we have a, a second study I didn't show for our, for our opposite end of the spectrum, who are HPV negative smokers with high volume disease that's not responsive. And those patients are on a study that actually gets an MR guided subvolume boost with the advantage that if you look at the dose escalation data from, from Ghent, um, what we found in those patients was mucosal ulceration was the rate limiting step. We believe that using um, good onboard imaging and um, mucosal sparing approaches, we may be able to dose escalate without that. So it's a mucosal sparing, dose volume, sub-escalation um, technique. But again, it's a phase one we just put first patient um, uh, accrued on that. So it's very, it's very early in the game. We might, we might be, unfortunately, you know, we don't want to end up where the get guys were stopping studies early because of the mucosal injury, but, but it's, it's, it's something we're going to take a crack at. Okay. No, no, that's great. Um, I don't think there's any more, any more questions, Dave. So look, I, I think that was a fantastic talk um, about how you can potentially really personalize radiotherapy in the future, not only by volume, but potentially even dose as well, which is, something I think quite different for radiation oncologists to think about when we're so used to prescribing the same dose for every patient. So, so who knows, we'll see what the future will bring, but obviously you've got some great clinical trials running and I'm sure that they'll generate some answers uh, and help us move. Yeah. So I'd just like to thank everyone, to thank you on behalf of the City of London Radnet Centre for taking the time out of your busy day to, to give us that great talk and, uh, and a quick round of applause. Oh, thank you all. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the great opportunity. It's great to see um, some friends and colleagues and hopefully we'll get to visit you guys soon.